so now, we're very blessed to have uh, Perry Saunders be speaking to us again. And the second part of his lecture is a visit to the Holy Land, a visit to the Holy Land. And he's got two readings. So the first one is in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. So hold on one second, let me get it up here. So and it reads, and that's 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. All that time Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, all the tribal heads and the ancestral leaders of the Israelites before him at Jerusalem in order to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from the city of David, that is Zion. Um, so all the men of, the, of Israel were assembled in the presence of Solomon in the 11th, sorry, the seventh month on the month of Ethanim in the festival, all the elders of Israel came and the priests pick up the ark. The priests and the Levites brought the ark of the Lord to the tent of meeting and the holy utensils that were in the tent. King Solomon and the entire congregation of Israel who had gathered around him were there with him in front of the ark, were sacrificing sheep and cattle that could not be counted or numbered because there were so many. The priests brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place beneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim were spreading their wings over the place of the Ark, so that the cherubim covered the Ark and its poles from above. The poles were so long that the ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they were not seen from outside the sanctuary. They are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had put there at Horeb, uh, where the Lord had made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. Then the priests came out of the holy place. The cloud filled the Lord's temple, and because of the cloud, the priests were not able to continue ministering for the glory of the Lord had filled the temple. And now we're going to turn over to the New Testament, to John chapter 17. And we're going to start at verse 17. So chapter 17, verse 17 to the end, which is 26. <clears throat> it starts off at verse 17 of chapter 17 of John. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also might be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be as one, as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they be made completely one, so the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as, as I have loved you. Father, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am. Uh, then they will see my glory, which you have given uh, me because I, you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and these have made known that you sent me. I made your name known to all of them and will make it known so that the love you loved me with um, may be in all of them and I may be in them. That reads um, John 17, verse 17 through 26. So we'll turn our attention over to our brother Perry Saunders, who will give us um, his address on uh, a visit to the Holy Land. Thank you. Who's excited for the kingdom? Good. Is there anyone here that feels like Lot's wife, that you have unfinished business that you need to attend to before you go? Hopefully not. 
I'm pumped to go, and I hope you are as well. And we're going to go up there today. We're going to take a visit to the Holy Land. And uh, it'll be fun to all go up together. So just a recap from uh, yesterday, for those of you that weren't with us, we talked about that Solomon's uh, kingdom is the template for the Lord Jesus' kingdom. Uh, as a time of great peace and prosperity. Even though it's a time of rest, the, the word rest is sort of referring to um, rest from their enemies. There will be no more persecution of them. There's going to be lots of actual work being done, and we looked at the uh, building programs that Solomon and Hiram from Tyre put together to uh, build the temple. Human cre creativity is going to be unleashed in the kingdom uh, for glorifying God, not for glorifying man, but for glorifying God. And it will be somewhat of a new renaissance. Big topographical changes are going to happen in the Middle East and uh, we looked at the division of the land, what the, the Middle East uh, will look like in the kingdom, and of course, uh, a little bit of a chat about Yahweh Shema, that hotel city for the folks, for the travelers that will go up to Zion. So today we're going to um, take a journey up to the temple from the perspective of a mortal family. Uh, obviously, we all want to be immortal saints, but um, we're going to look at it from the point of view for the mortal population. So we think that it's going to be a 50-year time period from the return of the Lord Jesus to raise the dead and to the uh, establishment or the opening of the kingdom. In that time period, uh, Armageddon's got to happen, the, the nations have got to come into submission, uh, the temple's got to be built, and all these things. And so um, when we think about the temple construction, for example, we look at the Holy Land today, it's mostly desert. Uh, we know that it's all going to come to life with those uh, rivers of, of uh, living water that are going to come out of Zion. Everywhere they go, it's going to flourish. And that, uh, like a mustard seed, is going to spread throughout the whole earth eventually so that uh, a handful of corn can be gotten off the top of the hill. But um, big, big... Uh, employment sort of situation to build the temple. We know that the Gentiles are going to go up there and gain employment and, and everybody's going to be involved in building this house of prayer for all nations. And uh, it's going to be magnificent. There's going to be one language, one faith, one king, and of course one God. And so uh, that's something that we all look forward to. Do any of you ever take a, take a moment to just pause and look around you at the world and think the day is fast approaching when this will all be a thing of the past, when we will transition from the kingdom of man to the kingdom of God and that we'll look back on, uh, on this time period and think we didn't think the kingdom, you know, the, the kingdom always seems so far away, but now we're here. Well, that day's coming very soon, I think, and uh, certainly something to be excited about. So, before we moved up here, um, my family was down in Florida and in Orlando particularly, and Disney, of course, rules the roost down there, and everything in Orlando revolves around Disney. In, in a corny sort of way, I think that um, what, what we might see in the future is sort of loosely based on what we see with Disney, and that Disney does things so efficiently, uh, and I think we'll see that in the kingdom. So if you imagine that you're a mortal family and uh, all these things have, have been established now. So the kingdom of God's open for business. The temple's built. Uh, Jesus is ruling over all people. Um, it eventually gets to the point where uh, you have to go up to Zion, right? It says that uh, every year for the Feast of Tabernacles, people will go up there to celebrate it. And so imagine with your family, people are going to start to be healthier and live longer. And so... We might have grandma and grandpa, the kids, and then uh, the grandkids are going to all travel up together as a family. And so you can imagine sitting down and, and planning that out, this, this uh, exciting thing of you're going to go up to Zion and you're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ and all the wonderful things up there. And so you start planning for this trip far in advance. 
and uh, you've got to figure out how you're going to get there. And then when you get there, you're going to be going to Yahweh Shema. What section are you going to stay in? There's, it's split up into the 12 tribes of Israel. And so you're going to be in one of those tribal uh, sections of the city. And then you're going to probably pick your hotel and pick the things that you want to do while you're there. And then, of course, plan the actual trip up to the temple. So this is all like an exciting thing that uh, a family would, would go through. Now, we, we mentioned yesterday that Jerusalem is the crossroads of the world. You've got Asia and Africa and uh, Europe all sort of cross through that one point. So God has set everything out just perfectly so that uh, it's right in the, in the right spot. And it will come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come up against Jerusalem shall even go up year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so people are going to uh, travel up there. And we talked a little bit yesterday about Yahweh Shema. And I've got the snowflake there. That's what I thought would be uh, perhaps something maybe God would design it that way. So that we've got the 12 sections there. And then, of course, Yahweh Shema means the Lord is there. So if you can imagine being in the city and you look north, you'll see uh, the temple way up high on the hill with the cloud of Shekinah glory over it. And remember we thought that you'll probably stay in Yahweh Shema for a period of time. You're going to all the trouble to go up to the Holy Land. And so there'll be things happening in that city. And it's a very big city. It's 11 miles by 11 miles, so over 100 times the footprint of the temple. And we know that the Jewish people are going to come down there from their separate tribes and they're going to serve in that city, serving the nations, and thereby humbling themselves. And the nations are going to get to like the Jews and, and it's all going to work together. Um, very well. Exactly the opposite of what we see today. So we're going to start with the end. So I think if we can figure out this bottleneck, then that will sort of give us a whole bunch of information that we can uh, put together in order to see what this is going to be like. So the bottleneck in, in the whole situation that we work backwards from is the gates how you get into the actual temple. Now, this is from Brother Henry Sully's book. Uh, if you're interested in this subject, it's, you, you've got to get the book and read through it. It's a bit of a slog um, when it's talking about the measurements and stuff like that. You can do a whole Bible school just on the measurements of how big everything is and whatnot. But we're just going to do an overview of it. But people have got to get through these gates. And you know coming in and out of this hall here that uh, the doorway there feels a bit small sometimes. And... And the doorway is really what determines how many people come in and and out. And so that gateway, and there's a lot of them we'll talk about in a moment, but you have two 20-foot doorways, if you like. So it's probably not unlike the stage here, and they're about 26 feet high. And that's what we're going to use to get all the people in and out of the temple. But we want to do it in an orderly fashion. We don't want it to be like uh, Black Friday sales. All right, so we're going to do some math here and then we can work backwards. So I, I want to put it to you that going to Zion, going to the temple is a once in a, in a generation experience. It's not, uh, the gates simply aren't big enough for everybody in the world to go in and out of there once a year. So it'll be people from all nations going up each year, but individuals will only get to go up uh, once in a generation, I think. And the reason I think that is, if you imagine uh, that gate, on the north side we have slaying blocks. So we have four blocks, four slaying blocks per gate. And I imagine that if you had 40 people for each of those slaying blocks, that would give you 160 people per gate. And there's going to be sacrifice there, and you're going to witness a sacrifice. And you can imagine the priests coming out to your group of 40. It's grandma and grandpa, the kids and the grandkids, a group of 40 or so. And you're going to present an animal, a lamb or or a bullock or something. And the priest is going to talk you through it, tell you what this is about. And we'll talk more about sacrifice in a minute. But um, So we're not just going to 
make this a quick thing. It, and he's going to take us through and explain why, why we're doing it and what the bloodshed represents and, and integrate it with what the Lord Jesus Christ actually went through to impress upon the people that, that everything they have comes from his sacrifice. And so if we give people 10 minutes for that, to slay the animal and have a bit of a talk about it, and then to, in an orderly fashion, move through the gateway, that would mean that you have 160 people per gate. There's 11 gates, 9 or 11, we don't know until we get there, but speculate 11 gates uh, on the north side for the sacrifice, and we have 11 gates on the south side for the offerings. And so that would mean that each 10 minutes, you have about 3,500 people entering in through those gates. So that equates to... Uh, about 126,000 people per day. And, and my math could be way off here, depending on how, how um, often people are, are moving in and out of the temple. I speculate, knowing what it's like to have jet lag, that people won't get the most out of it if they're up there at 3 o'clock in the morning. So these mortal population... They, they are humans and they are on a sleep schedule. And I know from working in the airline industry that you do your best work between sort of sun up and sun down. So if that's the case, we would have people arriving for the morning and then sort of leaving in the afternoon. And we think as far as the sacrifices go that there's going to be a morning and evening, evening sacrifice. And I speculate that there's going to be a 3 p.m. sacrifice uh, of burnt offerings and peace offerings to uh, commemorate the death of the Lord, okay, because he died around 3 p.m. So in any case, if that's our number, 126,000 people per day, and we use a Magic Kingdom down in Florida as an example, if you've been down there uh, and walked around down there, on their busiest days when the car parks are full, they'll get about 55,000 people in Magic Kingdom. So we've, got, we've almost got three times that. So a lot of people. Now, if the world population is a billion people, because we know that um, the catastrophe initiated by the Zechariah 14 earthquake uh, will have a lot of devastation, and this, and remember, when the Lord returns and the judgments happen on the earth, that it's sort of, it's right there with Noah's flood as far as judgment on the earth. Now, we're not going to end up with only eight people left, but it's, it's a catastrophic event. So anyway, if we just pick a number out of the air of a billion people, that would mean that an individual goes up to the temple once every 22 years. That's all the gates can fit, right? That's all the gates can fit. If there's 10 billion people, then you only go up every 220 years. So this is a very, 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 very special event to go up to, to the tabernacle to the temple. Uh, and of course, there it says at the bottom, building will hold many more workers, priests and saints that are not included in these calculations. So you could have sort of double that number of people in there at any one time. All right, so Yahweh Shemar is over 100 times the area of the temple. We talked yesterday about it being a, an education city that people would go up there and, and get their degrees in, uh, in uh, theology or whatever we, we would call it. Um, and then take that knowledge back to their home towns or cities. There's 20 miles between Yahweh Shema there and the temple, 20 miles. And we talked yesterday about that the temple would probably be around five to 6,000 feet at a guess. And so if you can imagine in that 20 miles, you've got to hike up uh, potentially 6,000 feet. All right? And... We have 21,000 people per hour entering the temple gates. So imagine if you all leave Yahweh Shema at the same time, what that crowd would look like. You've got 21,000 people every 10 minutes marching up there. And if you have cattle with you, um, we're not exactly sure how that's going to work, but cattle tear up the ground. Um, people have to stop for potty breaks and snack breaks and and you think, okay, well, how far can you actually travel in a day? And what are you going to be like when you get there after you've climbed that 6,000 feet? 
20 mile hike up a mountain through the king's land. So I, I think we've got a problem here that needs to be solved. Uh, the picture there is, is me with my two eldest kids. We're in a national park down near uh, Grand Canyon there one day. It was Archer's National Park and we had to h- hike one mile in or something like that to see this big arch. And you can see how old the kids are there roughly. Well, after about 10 minutes of this walking, they're like, Dad, carry me, carry me. And so it became quite the one-mile hike for me, carrying, lugging these two kids. Um, So it wasn't really fun, and there was no real elevation change, and it certainly wasn't 20 miles. So we have a problem. How how are we going to get all these mortals from Yahweh Shemar up up to the temple? I believe there's a solution. Now, I'm a bit of a train buff. In my early 20s, I was a locomotive engineer in training. Uh, my dad's a locomotive engineer. And that's the, the glorious engine that I used to drive. Isn't she a beauty? 3,000 horsepower. So when I think about trains, they're the most efficient means of transport across the ground. And uh, before any tomatoes get thrown, you have to remember that yesterday I said Brother Roberts suggested that there would be electric trams all through Yahweh Shema. So it's not unprecedented. So CSX today says that they can move one ton of freight uh, on one gallon of diesel 500 miles. Isn't that incredible? So rail is the, is the best way to get across the ground, I think. And I'm going to put it to you that we're not just going to go 20 miles straight north up to, the, up to the temple, but we're going to take a longer journey, and it's going to be very enjoyable. So when I get to the kingdom, I'm going to whisper in the Lord's ear and say, how are we going to do this? Because I've got a really good idea if you haven't thought of it. He, of course, has thought of it. He's had 2,000 years to plan it all out. So his, his answer is going to be better than mine. But if I were the minister for transportation in the kingdom, this is what we'd be doing. All right. So our route that we want to take is going to take us south out of Yahweh Shema, across the salt flats, through perhaps Sodom and Gomorrah, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then we're going to travel along the eastern side of the Living Sea, And we've got to go up and see uh, a mausoleum up there as part of the trip. And then we're going to cross over the sea and perhaps um, travel up along near one of the valleys. We've got to go past a Gehenna area, which is not fun to think about, and then to the temple. But if you can imagine being on a nice dome car, like you're going to have a great view of all the land as you go through the king's country, and you might have breakfast on the train, perhaps. And there's no destruction or pollution in the king's portion of the land. Nobody's dropping trash. We don't have to stop for potty breaks all, the, all along the way. The kids aren't getting tired. And uh, we just have this really beautiful, enjoyable ride up to the temple. We were up in New Hampshire the other day, took a full train ride through the, through the scenery up there. It was magnificent. Anyway. So that's my idea. So let's assume that that's what happened. So we we all bought our train. We've all got our tickets and we bought our train and we leave Yahweh Shema. Well, the first stop is this salt flat, which happens to be there. And so we're going to teach some lessons about this. And uh, we talked about the salt being used for the sacrifices. Now, we also may end up going through Sodom and Gomorrah. You think, Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, there's a lot of precedent in the scriptures for God taking things that are broken or destroyed and fixing them. And there's a a section in Ezekiel 36, verse 35, that we read in the readings the other day, where God's talking about rebuilding cities and so forth. Well, in Matthew chapter 11, the Lord sort of speaks to this a bit, and he talks about, of course, he did most of his preaching up in the northern part of Galilee, And he didn't get so great of a response there. So in Matthew chapter 11, he says, Woe unto thee, in verse 21, 
Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. And then he says in verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in, that, in the day of judgment than for thee. So, you know, what, what does that mean? If you look at the, at the map here, in Jesus' time, Capernaum, of course, is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, about 600 feet below sea level, and uh, there's a city there. And Sodom, of course, is underneath the water and covered in salt and buried and, and gone. But in the kingdom, we know that that whole valley is going to get filled up with water, and we know that the salt marshes, which is where Sodom and Gomorrah are, are going to be elevated at least 1,300 feet perhaps, um, that, that that would put it lifted up, right? Because it's right in the same area as the salt marshes. Capernaum, on the other hand, though, is going to be flooded. When that water goes over the top, they're going to be 600 feet underwater. So there's what Christ is saying, perhaps, that you're going to sink down into hell and it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah for Sodom in the in the day of judgment, the land, than for Capernaum. Anyway, might be a little clue there. Now, as our train moves along the eastern side of the Dead Sea, or the Living Sea now, we're going to have just the most spectacular views of, um, of the Holy Land. And so this, this picture here I had made up um, Looking, looking up the valley of Achor towards the temple. And so you can see the temple there is uh, about 6,000 feet above sea level. And you have this beautiful valley there and the, and the living sea. And we know the fishermen are going to be there. And so you're going to see this as you travel along the eastern side of the living sea. So this valley of Achor comes up in scripture and it, it talks about it. Um, and Sharon shall be a fold of flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people who have sought me. That's in Isaiah 65. And then Hosea 2 says it's a door of hope. And so it's just going to be this beautiful valley with all the animals lying down in it. And perhaps they, they move through there as they go up to the, to the temple. Um, when the actual Zechariah 14 earthquake happens and Christ's feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, we know that the Mount of Olives splits in two and you have from Geba to Rimon, this big valley, which uh, is about 30, 36 miles long or something. So that's all part of the earthquake. But it's, the land's just going to be so beautiful. All right. So we've made our way, uh, continuing along the eastern side of the shoreline. We've got to go up to this place, uh, Gog's Mausoleum, the city of death. And in Ezekiel... 30, oh, sorry, 47. No, it's in Ezekiel 39. Today's readings talks about this. So after Armageddon, we have the big cleanup operation that goes on in Ezekiel 39. And we know that this army is going to be massive, right? This army that comes across against the Holy Land in Armageddon. And it's going to take seven months to bury the dead. And people are going to get employed to go pick up the the bones and such. Well, they've all got to be transported to one place because we don't want these dead bodies uh, littered around the land. And so, where is it? Here it is. Verse 11. And it will come to pass in that day that I'll give unto Gog a place where uh, there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers of the east. That's why we think maybe that, that would have that route along there the valley of the passengers of, on the east, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And over in verse 16, it talks a bit more about it, and in the margin it says the multitude. All right, so this stopping of the nose is not so much a smell thing because they're going to be buried and taken care of, but it's just a shock, like, oh, I can't believe... These people in the kingdom are, are going to be shocked to think that anybody would come against the Holy Land and try to destroy it. And so 
this mausoleum up there, this uh, city of, of death, uh, is going to be a reminder for all anybody that might have ideas of rebellion in their hearts to leave them behind. So then perhaps as the, as the journey goes a little bit to the north, we've got to cross over the Living Sea. We're going to come through the forests of Lebanon, perhaps. And so it says, we, we saw yesterday with Solomon that Solomon um, had, had a trade deal with the king of Tyre, whereby all these wonderful uh, timber, timbers would be floated down and then uh, they would use them in the building of the temple. And I think that's going to happen again. Now, I think we're going to see some miraculous growth of trees for this because we have to have timbers that are going to go into this building that are going to last a thousand years. And we want great big massive timbers and there's just none there anymore. They're trying to grow some trees of Lebanon now, but they, there's no forests up there. So these, these have got to grow and I think they'll grow miraculously. It says in Isaiah 29, is it not yet a very little while and Lebanon shall be turned to a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary and I will make the place of my feet glorious. And so I, I love to think of the Holy Land with these wonderful forests around. And we know there's going to be forests out in Arabia as well, not just up in Lebanon. Then we go through uh, this Gehenna place and it says Isaiah 66 24 they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me for their worm shall not die neither shall the fire be quenched and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh so this is something separate from the the uh, mausoleum to Gog this is for rebels in the kingdom and one of the wonderful things about the law of Moses which a lot of that's going to be re-established I think in the age to come is that there's no prisons in the law of Moses. Here in America, we have more people in prisons per capita than anywhere, any other country in the world. And it's kind of a business here. But under the law, there's no prisons. If you're, if you're a murderer, then you die. If you steal something, then you have to pay it back twice. Uh, if you don't have the money, then you have to work it off. And so that's uh, God's wisdom there. But there will be rebels and uh, from time to time, and this is where they're going to be uh, disposed of. So, wow, we finally pull up and we, we arrive up at Zion uh, at this fantastic uh, temple and uh, we're going to get out of the train and we're going to go look at it. Now, nobody's tired by the way because we just had this enjoyable ride and we've all had a nice breakfast and we've had a look at the things along the way and so we're energized and ready for a big day ahead as opposed to how you might feel if you walked the 100 miles with your children uh, up 6,000 feet. So obviously this is a metaphor for the Lord Jesus, but I look forward to the day when the actual cornerstone is laid for this building. And I want to be there when they lay it. If you go to the Western Wall today, you can go on a tour and you'll see a stone in the Western Wall that's 600 tons. And they don't know how they put it there. They've got no idea how they, they got that thing there. But there's going to be this, there has to be, when you build a building, a chief cornerstone. And I think it's fitting that there, this cornerstone will be laid. It'll definitely be covered in gold if it's not solid gold itself. And uh, it'll be dedicated to the Lord Jesus. And there's lots and lots and lots of references about this chief cornerstone. So when we look at the size of the temple, this is over Magic Kingdom. For those of you that have been down to Florida to, to Disney, the Magic Kingdom, you spend your day walking through that place and you're, you're worn out by the end of it, really worn out, especially if you've got kids with you. And looking at the map there, the Magic Kingdom takes up about one quarter of the footprint of the temple. So that gives you an idea of the size and scale of this building. Now, if we do a quick overview of the temple, um, like I said, this is a whole Bible school just to go through all the, all the little bits of information, but we've got this building a mile by a mile with an inner ring uh, three miles long and inside the ring a, a mountain, Mount Zion, and on top is the altar. Well, as the people come, there's, a, there's an order to this. So if you come in the north side, which is where you will offer animal sacrifice, then you would head south and come out the southern side. If you come in the southern side, which is where you offer 
offerings, which would be uh, the first fruits of your fields or, or money or whatever it is you want to offer, then you would exit out the north. In that way, uh, there's no chaos in theory. So, and then on the, on the edges, we have the corner towers, which we'll talk about in a moment. The ring, the outer section of the ring is, is where the judgment halls are going to be and, and uh, the singers. And on the inner side of that ring is the most holy place. And so only the saints can go in there and the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, right up on top of the hill, we have the altar. And on the eastern wing, over here, this is dedicated just to the Lord and to uh, his saints that come up and cycle through there to do his work. And so the mortals aren't allowed on the, on the eastern side. And this western side doesn't talk much about that, but we expect to see uh, a lot of the dining halls and stuff like that along there as well. So before we go into the temple, it's fitting, right? This is, this is God's house. It's fitting that people have to be cleansed. And so as you read through Ezekiel um, 47, it tells you about this river that you have to cross over and it has different depths as you go along. If you've already been baptized, then all you need to do is wash your feet. And so it talks about the first um, 2,000 foot section, you just wash your feet. So if you're baptized, just wash your feet and you're good to go in. If you're not baptized though and you want to get baptized, you can get baptized further along the river. It gets deeper until it's up to the waist. And so you can imagine, imagine being baptized and then uh, enjoying a fellowship meal inside after you're freshly baptized. It'd be fantastic. And of course then the further, further east you go, the river gets too big to cross over and uh, that keeps everybody where they need to be. Along, the, along that river, we know there's uh, these amazing trees that offer different fruits for every month, and uh, their leaves are medicines for the nations. And so I can imagine people gathering these leaves on their way out to take back home for uh, medicinal uses. So sacrifice and offering, um, this has caused a lot of confusion and, and debate amongst brethren and sisters over the years whether or not there'll be sacrifice obviously we're not sacrificing for sin anymore because we have the covering of the lord jesus through baptism but just like the law of moses in the old days uh, the sacrifices pointed forward to the sacrifice of christ in the kingdom they point back to the sacrifice of christ and remember that in the kingdom these people are not going to see wars and bloodshed like we see every day and so it's going to be a, a remembrance and think of you're only doing this once every 20 years or so um, just how shocking it was that christ's blood was spilt for all of us and so um, lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, verses about sacrifices being reinstituted but just uh just remember that imagine if you're in a group of 40 people you're going to offer one animal in remembrance as, a, as an educational tool once a generation, all right? So we're not slaying animals every time we misspeak. And of course, the southern side there is where we bring our offerings. David the doorman, so King David spends a lot of time talking about this future house and it says one thing I've desired of Yahweh is that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple so David's desire is to he couldn't build the temple because he was a man of war but he's probably going to be heavily involved in building this one and he's going to spend I think I think he's going to actually have a residence in there because he just wants to be there so much and there's lots and lots of references uh, to that. So as we enter through the gates, we come into this big sort of promenade, this courtyard. And if you see the picture right up on the very top there, it's, um, that's called the Porch of Solomon. So in Jesus' time, this is where the Pharisees and the, the learned people would sit around and they would kick back ideas on what do you think of this and what do you think of that? And you can imagine in the kingdom um, us doing the same thing in these areas and I mentioned the Renaissance yesterday 
So one of the things about classical architecture, and I'm not an expert, but everything has ratios and it's all thought of. So in Paris and, and some of these cities in Europe that everybody wants to go to, it's an enjoyable place to be. The way they've designed it is that their, their buildings are about three to seven stories high. Um, they don't have the big high rises like we have and they have courtyards and they're designed so that a, a mother can reach out the window and yell at her children across the courtyard and they be able to hear her. And so we see that sort of echoed here in, in Sully's design of the temple there. And so I think the whole thing's just going to work together wonderfully. These kitchen towers are, are quite massive, 480 feet tall, we think. And so next to the Great Pyramid of Giza, that shows you just how massive these corner towers are. Now, obviously, all these people coming in, we've got all this good food coming in. We've got the, the meats coming in from the north side and we've got uh, all, all the other foods coming in through the south side, and it's the best of the best, right? So if you're, if you're gonna bring wine up to the temple, you're gonna bring your best wine, aren't you? And so we're gonna have fellowship meals up there together, and we all know as brethren how, what it's, how lovely it is to have a potluck and be together for those fellowship meals, and these towers, we think, are gonna prepare all that food. And so you can imagine the aromas that we'll smell as we're, as we're going through the the tabernacle through the temple. Um, so I crunched some numbers on this and using just the three levels of the northwest and southern outer buildings of the outer court, we would end up with 765 dining halls, each 40 by 80 feet long. So about the size of the hall, I guess, here. And that would seat comfortably uh, about 146,000 people in one sitting. And so you can see why those towers have to be so big that we can all sit down and eat together and all have our food delivered on time. And I am really looking forward to some of the meals that we're gonna have up there. Now as saints, you don't have to eat obviously, but we know that you can and we will. The Lord Jesus ate fish and honey after he, he was um, glorified. And we're gonna enjoy doing that together as well. Now the east wing, this is really special. This sends shivers up my spine to think about this, but there's this beautiful verse in Luke 12, verse 37, and it says, this is the Lord talking. He said, blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he comes shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to, to meet and will come forth and serve them. Can you imagine sitting down at the table and the Lord Jesus taps you on the shoulder and says, can I top your wine up? Incredible, incredible. But that's, that's our king. Now this east wing, talk about location, 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 right? Picture this. Um, on the east wing of that temple, you're at 6,000 feet and it's about 15 miles down to the living sea. So anybody that's going to Colorado, going up Pikes Peak, if you're up Pikes Peak and you look down on the city, uh, that's about the same sort of distance. And you're gonna be looking down on this living sea with the Valley of Acor in between and the animals down there and the beauty and the palaces. And uh, it's gonna be spectacular to be up there having a meal with the Lord, looking out over that. We have this separate place, which is colored in green there, and not a whole lot's talked about it, but I imagine it's being decked out very similar to the Garden of Eden. We know that it's gonna be uh, that glorious. And so people will come out there and sit down and, and uh, perhaps watch the sacrifice be consumed, listen to the singing, uh, sit down, perhaps have, uh, have a picnic. Absolutely beautiful to think of all these people in this area, in this beautiful, beautiful place, uh, all together enjoying it. Once we get to the ring of the inner temple, um, we have the judgment halls. We know that there's gonna be, it's gonna be basically the Supreme Court of the world. And the building here is the Supreme Court of the United States to scale against the inner ring uh, building. So just a massive, massive building. And of course it's three miles long. 
We're going to be uh, cycling through there, by the way, as judges from time to time, I would imagine. So the wisdom that we gain here in this life is going to be used in the kingdom age. And so may we gain wisdom, knowledge and understanding now so that we can be those judges in the future. Beautiful building. Uh, it's next to uh, I put Solomon's Temple there in comparison and, of course, the White House as well. Again, this is to scale. And in Sully's book, he pretty much lays out the skeleton of the building. We'd imagine the building to be a beautiful white stone, certainly in places covered in gold uh, and precious stones, and then have um, vines and, and wine, wine um, grape vines and so forth growing over it. So it's going to be just uh, absolutely beautiful. That, that inner ring building is also known as the Chamber of the Singers. And so imagine the singing that we will have. One of the things I think people will do when they go up to Zion is that they, they may say, well, I'm part of a choir and I'm going to do a performance while I'm up there. And that, that's maybe something that, that people will do. And so we're going to hear the most beautiful um, music up there with singing. And I don't know what it's like acoustically, but imagine if you set it up so that the singing echoed around that three mile space uh, with the harmonies and so forth, it's gonna be glorious. The, the top side of it will be where the Levites that are serving as priests, they have to do all the dirty work. They're gonna do the slaying, get the blood on their hands, all that stuff. Um, and the immortals will be down on the southern side there. So they're referred to in Ezekiel as the sons of Zadok and uh, the Levites will be mortal Le Levitical priests that will be serving in the temple there as well. Now, as far as the altar goes, Brother Sally talks about this uh, interesting situation whereby it talks about an altar of wood in the temple. It tells you its width and its, its depth, but it doesn't tell you the length. So he speculates that it's, it goes around the entire... Um, three mile ring of the inner temple until it gets around to a particular place where it's then conveyed up to the altar on top of the hill from there. But so you can imagine as you go through, you present your sacrifice, it's then uh, taken away, put on this, on this table that goes around the circle to the elevation point to go up. Then, of course, inside that ring is the most holy place where only the saints and the Lord Jesus can be. And the reason for that is because we know that no man can see God and live. Um, we have the examples of Moses' face shining uh, with just the angel and the Apostle Paul being struck blind by the glory. And so human beings and God's glory don't mix. It's like staring at the sun. You can't do it. And so... The inner portion is the most holy, only for immortal people. And so these sacrifices will be taken up top. And I said, we've got the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, and, and most likely one at 3 p.m. each day for the burnt and peace offerings. And it's all listed in Ezekiel. It's all there of all the different types of sacrifices. And uh, we have this massive altar up on top, 144 feet uh, by 144 feet. You could park... Um, a big airplane, a big jetliner up there. Uh, that's the footprint of how big it is. And these sacrifices will be consumed by the glory of God. So Joseph read for us the, what it was like when, when God's glory came into the temple, that the priests couldn't do their work, the cloud was so thick, um, and, and we're going to see that again. So this is using my little model down here. If you haven't seen it, it's uh, over hidden behind the piano, but it just models this whole area. And uh, so this is a little video of sort of the glory of God uh, in this place. And we're told that there's no need for the light of the sun or the moon by night because the glory of God will light it up. And so this gives you like a little bit of a vision of what that might, might look like. So I think that we are going to actually, and, and I'm sort of moving away from the mortals now to the immortals. When we go up to serve there, one of the privileges that we're gonna have is to be inside this 
um, most holy place, which we think is covered with a, with a tent or a dome of cloud. And the cloud is there to protect the mortals from God's glory. And uh, we're going to be inside that cloud. And I think that when we go up and place these things on the altar, that we may actually stand on the altar as they're being consumed by the fire of God from the sky. And we know that there's a precedent for it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace where that fire was seven times hotter than the hottest fire or however it's worded, uh, and they didn't even smell like smoke. And so for immortal beings, this is something we could experience. And I try to imagine what it would be like to be inside this cloud with the glory of God consuming these sacrifices and we're in there with the Lord Jesus. So just sort of mind-boggling stuff that mortals have trouble with. And uh, there's a few references there to the cloud. So anyway, uh, thanks for your patience. It's been a big day and it's time to head back to the hotel now. The kids are worn out. Thankfully, they don't have to walk all the way back or thankfully, dad doesn't have to carry them all the way back. So head back down to Yahweh Shema where you can decompress, enjoy a few days there, a few weeks there before you head back to uh, your homes. And so verily I say unto you, this is the Lord Jesus as we focus our minds now on, on the table before us. He says, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so I think that's something that the Lord Jesus really, really is looking forward to. And I'm certainly looking forward to that being fulfilled. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom.